The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All righty. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Drew English. I'm the program coordinator here at the Exit Planning Institute. I am with uh, Kyle Madden from KLH Capital. Uh, today, he uh, will be talking to us about an introduction to private equity and defining recapitalizations. Uh, before I turn it over to Kyle, uh, just a few housekeeping uh, notes from myself. Uh, one, the webinar is being recorded, and I will send out the recording to you afterwards. So just look for an, an email from me later today with that attachment for the recording. Uh, secondly, there's a chat box on your dropdown of GoToWebinar panel. Uh, we ask that you ask any questions or any comments you have, just put those in there. Uh, that will alert myself that there is a question, and then I'll moderate those over to Kyle um, at the end of the presentation. So just let us know if you have any questions or, or comments with that. And then also, um, Kyle has a, uh, a video in his slide deck that we couldn't get to work, unfortunately. Uh, so what I'm going to do is send the link to all of you via email. Uh, and so when, when Kyle and I uh, indicate that we want you to, to, to look at that clip, uh, just check your inbox for that for that clip there. I'll send it out here very shortly. Uh, but with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Kyle, and we'll get rocking and rolling today. So, Kyle, it's all yours. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Happy New Year to everybody. And uh, if you can flip me controls, I will launch this full screen. How does that look, Drew? Uh, it looks good. Good to go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, Thanks. Thanks. So today we're going to dive right in and I'm going to give you a brief introduction as to how private equity and private equity firms and funds are actually structured, what's the focus, what's the goal and objective, and what is the correlation with exit planning. So a little bit about myself, uh, I'm a partner at KLH Capital, we're headquartered down here in Tampa, Florida. I grew up north uh, in Amherst, New Hampshire. I spend my uh, day job time buying, structuring, and executing these sorts of transactions with, with business owners. Um, I sit on the board of directors to three of our portfolio companies, BMI Merchandise, which is a distributor of plush toys to family entertainment centers, uh, Midstate Machine and Fabricating, which is our case study for today. Uh, that are field services business uh, servicing predominantly the mining and processing industry. And then lastly, Data Display, which is a distributor of electronics to point of purchase display manufacturers. Um, I've got a degree from a school down here in Tampa, the University of Tampa, and I try and spend my time when I'm not in the office on a boat, whether a motorboat or a sailboat or out west uh, snow skiing, and I'm married to my high school sweetheart, Christine. Um, a little bit about KLH. Uh, see at the top, we manage a little bit under $320 million in assets. That $320 million is divided between three different funds. Uh, one fund was raised in 2005. Our next fund was raised in 2011. And we just recently put another fund together about 18 months ago. Um, that's $155 million that you're seeing below there. Um, we've got five active partners, 12 investment professionals in addition. Um, we've been doing this since uh, the mid 80s. Um, we've never moved upstream in terms of moving to larger and larger size transactions. So the skill set that we've built and the experience that we have, you know, positively and negatively, successes and failures have always been with working with family owned and privately owned businesses making between, you know, 10 and 100 million dollars of revenue. Um, what really matters here is the pie charts across the bottom. We were founded to and focused exclusively on working with family and privately owned businesses, like I mentioned, with an average revenue of 20. Um, all of the businesses that we partner with have never had a private equity group or a financial partner before. And each business that we partner with is entirely different and standalone with completely different families, with different management teams, different goals and objectives, pain points, successes, and current challenges. Um, so when you look at KLH in terms of why we exist, 
that is to partner with the current owners and management teams when they're looking to not only cash a big check, but accomplish something bigger, you know, such as organize the business so the boss can physically retire, spread ownership to key employees or their key lieutenants, um, transition ownership to the next generation of family, grow and professionalize the business at a rate that they can't accomplish by themselves. Um, in fact, it, it reminds me of a deal that we did just last year where the entrepreneur uh, was not at all looking to sell the business, but what he was looking to do and what he would say was, I'm lonely at the top. The top. I don't, I don't want to mess it up. up. I see a $50 million company when I go to sleep and he is $15 million right now, but he wanted somebody to help him make sea level decisions. Um, and that is what we hear from a lot of the entrepreneurial partners that, that we end up doing these transactions with. Um, so today, high level agenda, we want to understand private equity and how private equity groups work with companies um, and clients. We basic mechanics of an actual recapitalization. And I'll talk about you know, how they're structured, what they look like, what it actually is, a definition of it, um, as well as its benefits. We will uh, talk about how to identify when an owner or a company is a candidate for a recap. We'll walk through a case study, and then we'll quickly brush over uh, how to understand when and how to introduce the concept to, to a potential client. So we'll dive right in here. Um, what is private equity? Right? And, and it, it really starts, starts with a thesis or a skill set. What I mean by that is over the last 35 years, we continue to see owners who want good, solid monetary value for their business as they look to transition, but also want to do right by their people, they want to do right by their family, and they want help accomplishing initiatives often major initiatives before ultimately retiring, right? So you can back into the, quote, type of money a private equity firm needs or will want or need to manage given its thesis and skill set that it looks to employ. So on the slide here at the top, you're seeing a limited partnership or limited partners. Those are your investors. Um, you can raise money traditionally from pension companies, high net, high net worth individuals, family offices, endowments, uh, you know, pension plans, et cetera. Um, those dollars are legally committed. Typically, it's a 10-year fund. However, there is no actual physical established bank account with all of that money parked in it. Um, so, for example, if, if we all raised a $100 million fund, and we needed $10 million of that fund to do our first deal, we would not go to a savings account and pull $10 million out of it. In fact, we would call our limited partners or our investors, and they would physically back and wire us money for their pro rata piece of that $10 million, right? So the, the actual money, you know, looking down through the private equity fund and the actual investments, the money itself is used to accomplish really a myriad of goals in the context of a deal. From the proverbial chips off the table recap, or a partner or two wants to retire, and maybe a partner wants to retire, but the other partner wants to stay active. Um, we've done deals to clean up the ownership table, right? Some, may, some shareholders may already be inactive, and they want liquidity. Um, for their estate plan, but yet their other partner or maybe two other partners want to stay active and grow the company, or perhaps it's a little bit of all that. Um, a lot of our transactions, uh, they're not a one-size-fits-all box, and some shareholders want money, some shareholders want to stay active, and some shareholders want to accomplish both. Um, so it's important to note that the investments made here at the private equity firm are all standalone. Each company remains its own entity. There's no cross-collateralization. There's no centralized accounting. There's no commingled decisions on one company relative to another. They're all 
they're each independent standalone entity and investment. Uh, and the money here at our firm at KLH comes from all those partners and about a half dozen high net worth individuals um, who are, are all successful entrepreneurs within their own respective businesses. And we chose this type of money, thinking back to the type of money, we chose this type of capital strategically given that thesis, right? We understand that these businesses aren't perfect. They largely were started servicing one customer. And some still have customer concentration. We understand that their team, their people are really more than that. Um, and we wanted this type of capital so that we can be patient and make some decisions based on really what's best for the business and the people, not necessarily the bottom line. And um, it's fun investing our own money and owners take us and our advice as genuine. Across the PE industry, uh, different groups have different approaches and models. And I think some of you on this webinar have probably seen this before. Um, but the maturity of company at the top, I define that as, as basically five or more years of making money. Um, and I'm looking again for a minimum level of, of about $2 million of EBITDA. But um, we're looking at the maturity of the company because at the end of the day, we're betting that you know, company is making X million of EBITDA this year and will continue to make at least X million of EBITDA next year. Um, the operational involvement aspect is a huge differentiator from group to group and from each group's personality. Um, some of our investments and partners wanted uh, what we call an operational partner, you know, somebody who will work physically in their business every day or once a week or twice a week or monthly. Um, and we have a couple of these guys right now working in, in portfolio companies, whereas on the, on the opposite hand, some of our investments and entrepreneurs fundamentally don't want this type of employee or this type of, of partner seeing it almost as a, as a boss. So we play both sides of the fence um, and have staffed our group accordingly there. Um, Again, not a not a one size fits all box or, or shoe here. Um, the size of investments, there are firms out there that manage billions of dollars and are doing very, very large size transactions. And there are firms like us that, you know, despite 320 million or, or our latest fund of 155 million is a lot of money. These are uh, the, their businesses on the smaller end of the economy, you know, 10 plus million in revenue, two plus million in EBITDA. Um, in the world of private equity, uh, we're small. Daily is just small in the world of, of this industry. Um, and we wouldn't really have it any other way. I mean, that's our, that's our skill set. That's the type of people that, that we're successful with working uh, together with. So um, the industries of interest, there are groups out there that will look at you know, Silicon Valley tech startups, et cetera, that are firms that will only do you know, real old economy, kind of brick and mortar investments or companies. I think we are, we're more in the center, I think gravitating more towards the old style economy businesses, things that you can touch, feel, distribution, service, manufacturing. Um, however, it's, it's interesting to note that uh, these days, it's it's rare that we see a company that's not deploying technology in some role within the business, right? And think, think for example, in distribution, we're seeing a lot more of these business models uh, implementing an automated billing function or an automated inventory replenishment system, et cetera. So um, as the economy, as the cycle moves on, we're seeing technology play a larger and larger role in even the old school kind of brick and mortar businesses. Um, and then ownership interest, uh, there's groups that will only take a majority uh, equity position, right? Greater than 50%. And there's groups that will only invest in a minority position. Um, we offer both majority and minority. Uh, we recognize the folks who want or need a partner for help and growth and also want to cash a check, but see ultimately too much future value in the business to sell off, you know, more than less. So this here, this slide is a, is a page directly out of our uh, introductory slide deck that we walk the business owner through. It covers a lot of what, what I've just talked about. 
um, but we include it in here so you guys can see exactly what the business owner sees when it comes to introducing KLH and how we do that. The next slide here, comically, um, we'd like to buy the circus, but we want to bring in our own people. Right? It's the classic misconception of value creation and what makes the business the business, right? which as we know is, is largely the people. Um, so while comical here, uh, we think it's critical for you guys to understand that there's different flavors, structures, and personalities you know, in the PE industry and getting the people part right is call it 75 percent of this right and and then the the amount of money the type of money um the actual valuation the spreadsheet side of the business call it 25 percent so this slide walks through a, a playbook of how private equity increases the overall equity value of the business and that's the big idea within private equity right is growing the equity value of the business together in partnership with the family and the management team and harvesting that value together that's the main goal and objective so money's only part of the solution and in fact when you think about it if money was the only objective you guys probably wouldn't call us right we wouldn't be getting calls from you guys because the you know there's a lot of people that will just simply loan the money so the initiatives are typically yes we want a big check for the beginning of a retirement plan or a retirement plan but also we want to accomplish why we want to gift equity to management we want to gift equity to the son or the grandson or the granddaughter etc or we want to grow right we want a big check today but we also want to grow and harvest that amount or that liquidity later um, and that is a recapitalization uh, to a to a definition here so as you guys are reviewing the terminology and and the, the topics listed on the slide note the initiatives here and the relationship between you know lower middle market private equity and you guys as exit planners um, I, I know some of these items are projects that you're already working on and you know from managing family dynamics and politics at the dinner table to getting the org structure or legal entity rationalization cleaned up, focusing on delegation, uh, and very simply put, you know, prepping the business. I mean, this is a playbook that we work with the business owner to ultimately create you know, future equity value. And what the fund does is physically facilitate the liquidity event, but that's the easy part. And we also work with management to structure the business properly moving forward. Um, like I mentioned, grandkids or kids are in the right position or comp package. The key sales guys and the key ops guys are satisfied. Graduate the business from typically QuickBooks to more horsepower. Um, and oftentimes, these businesses, when you look at the employee base or the management base, they need more athletes on the team, right? And those athletes cost the business owner money. However, when you do these deals, let's say we own. 70% of the business, when we go to hire somebody, we are paying for 70 cents of that dollar, right? So what we figure out is when we go into these investments, we assume that we will need to hire and bolster out that team to focus on delegation so the boss can physically retire. And, and you know, my analogy there was athletes on the team. Don't think a ball hog or a new boss, but the right athlete to put, you know, assists and points on the board. Um, and a lot of companies struggle, particularly these days, with finding good qualified labor given the country's shortage of, of blue collar talent. Um, that's an area where we're very active. We source sales guys, ops teams, managerial help, accounting professionals. Um, so the, the analogy that I'd like to illustrate with you guys is think of think of buying your first house, right? Think of real estate. So we're, you know, we and management is increasing the square footage of the house, but KLH's role, the private equity firm's role is increasing the price per square foot of that house, right? So what we run into is situations where, we'll talk about this in the case study in a little bit, but maybe they've always wanted to buy another business and put them together, but don't want to risk their own money or reputation because they've never done it before. So 
we'll now move on to learning the basic mechanics of, of an actual recap. So an actual recap is a transaction where multiple shareholders or the shareholder sells a portion of their ownership to an equity firm to cash out some of their chips, if you will, and diversify their assets. And then after the transaction, as we've discussed, we work closely with the company leadership team to bring its long-term strategy to fruition. So mechanically, a recap is third-party money coming onto the balance sheet to physically recapitalize that balance sheet. What typically is coming is going on or, or coming into the balance sheet is excess capital. That capital is typically then quickly distributed off the balance sheet into their back pocket, and that is the liquidity event, you know, mechanically. Um, so when you look at the benefits of the recap, we'll hit on a number of these. Uh, all good investors know to spread your chips, right? This is something that you know, we were taught all as a young age. Um, we work with our clients for, but yet we see it all the time where these business owners have you know, 70, 80, 90% of their wealth tied to a single asset, right? Their business. And this concentration of wealth presents fairly significant financial risk to the owners and the families. So recapitalization allows the owner to diversify their wealth of the business so all their eggs are not in one basket. And in addition, moving a portion of their wealth into a more liquid asset class ensures that that money or those funds are available you know, if and when they need it down the road. Um, secondly, gaining more expertise in the room. Um, in a recap, the company gains a new partner to help tackle growth initiatives and business challenges. So we work side by side with these management teams evaluating and really prioritizing growth strategies, giving managers confidence in their decisions and investments that they're making every day. Um, so whether it be implementing software systems, recruiting executives, making acquisitions, or just simply responding to challenges, the company now has a vested, experienced partner to shoulder the load of, of that Q&A. Um, in fact, some owners view recapitalization as, a, as really a tool for breaking through barriers and accomplishing goals with a greater speed than what they could achieve on their own. Um, and as partners, our interests are obviously directly aligned. Successes, failures are shared, and we all you know, we all want to participate in that equity appreciation that we achieve together. When it comes to growing the value of the company, I touched on that a slide or two ago. Um, value, as we know, is created by you know, doing what? Growing the sales and the profitability through tactical decision making and operational efficiencies, synergistic acquisitions, and investments in. You know, people are the athletes that I hinted at, uh, technology and additional equipment. And in addition to business acumen, a, a private equity firm provides access to capital on more favorable terms. So the lenders, you know, even small town banks, small town lenders will have greater confidence in a company that's backed by an experienced private equity group, especially when they have a successful historical relationship with that group. And therefore, are more you know, likely to provide capital without the personal guarantees or risks to the business owner's personal assets. Um, and that's that's a big one that we work on uh, with these companies is to diversify the risk as well as get the personal guarantee you know un, um, undone. So when the owner doesn't have to use the personal balance sheet to fund the company's capital investment, they're 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 freed up, for lack of a better word. I mean, they're more apt to make the big decisions that will grow the business the most. And equally as important, um, availability to capital in these deals ensures that the business is nimble and can respond quickly to growth opportunities when they arise. When it comes to addressing varying shareholder needs, um, current shareholders, we've seen a lot of this lately. I mean, some shareholders may desire liquidity you know, over the course of their investment historically, particularly if they're you know, already inactive or physically retiring now. Um, and a recap allows you to buy out 
shareholders with um, divergent goals and place that equity in the hands of, of stakeholders and you know upcoming managers, upcoming family members who uh, want to be and who are directly aligned with the goal of creating equity value. Um, and when it comes to succession planning, as I've talked with, with a lot of you guys about, we get introduced to these situations sometimes at the very tail end of a succession plan and sometimes on day number one where the first step to a succession plan is taking the liquidity event. Um, so as, as you guys know, these small businesses, they tend to develop, they, they tend to depend heavily on the owners. Developing a succession plan is essential to the company's future because it allows the company and its employees to continue beyond the founder's tenure. And it also protects against undesirable outcomes in the event of, um, you know, an unforeseen accident or death, et cetera. Um, that's exactly what happened to one of our partners um, in the portfolio where he was unfortunately in a car accident and that's what tips his light bulb on that he needed a succession plan. So it's common to use a recapitalization as really the, the, the catalyst or the opportunity to identify key managers who can take the business forward and then together we reward them with equity ownership right guys who have never been owners before who dream of being an owner but if the business is big it's it's, it's expensive for them to buy in we can gift them that equity and in doing so we align their goals and the, and the total shareholders and interest and provide them with an opportunity to create you know generational wealth for, for themselves and their families um, and in, in addition, um, a recap here frees up the owner from playing the bank, right? I mean, being its primary source of capital um, and personal loans. So as discussed earlier, a partner here allows the company to fulfill its capital needs independent of the owner so that it can operate successfully regardless of the owner's affiliation. And some founders uh, that we're introduced to are nervous about how their employees will respond to a recap at a new partner. A healthy reaction and reality. Um, in our experience, the company's employees are typically relieved to learn that you know there now is a smooth succession plan. The founder is addressing you know his or her succession plans because it it gives the employees visibility into what the next chapter looks like and and you know it helps confidence about their livelihoods. Um, and the last thing that I'll touch on on the slide is the is the just proverbial kind of two bites of the apple, right? And increasing the total value that they receive. Um, and given the, the benefits that we've discussed thus far, some of these owners view a recapitalization as a means for maximizing their company's value as they head towards retirement, right? I think that's the, that's the right way to be looking at these, um, whereas others kind of use this partnership to accomplish those last couple of ideas before you know, hanging up the boots, right? So it's, it's back to that analogy of, sure, you know, money is the first and foremost objective, but there's always a second piece to it, either growing the company substantially that they can't do right now on their own, or gifting equity to management, gifting the next generation of kids into the deal, professionalizing that business, you know, running it full tilt boogie before the big ultimate exit down the road. Commonly, as we all know, as, as the second part of the apple. So at the firm, KLH, it's important that you know, active owners and management teams retain significant equity in our partnerships and participate in the appreciation that we create together. Um, and we also work closely with owners in the subsequent sale process to ensure that we achieve and you know we achieve their goals and, and honor their legacy when it comes to how we exit the investment years and years down the road, whether that be a sale you know, to their management team. Right, we'll help the business owners sell a piece to us. We work with the business to grow the business, and we raise financing and ultimately sell 100% to the management team, um, which is a wonderful transaction. Likewise, sell it back to all the family members so the business stays in the family or, or another company, right? another third-party company. 
So we've hit on this, but just, just graphically here, you're starting to see the flexibilities of a recap, right? And we work with you guys as advisors and likewise the business owners to custom tailor a transaction that accomplishes their goals. So next up is our is our video. Uh, did you were you able to uh, send out the link through? Yes, I sent out the link via email. Uh, they should have gotten it about ten minutes ago. Okay, perfect. So um, uh, it's not perfect here. I was actually planning on playing this through the GoTo webinar, but if everyone can, why don't you turn your speakers up, click that link that Drew had sent out to you guys. The video is about four minutes long, so why don't you watch through that video in its entirety? Um, I'm going to put my phone on mute, and then I'll come back in four minutes, and we'll talk through you know a little bit more about what you're hearing. Um, so push play and, and enjoy. We'll chat in four minutes.
All right, so I think if I was counting correctly, that should have been you know, four or five minutes there for you guys to get through that video. Uh, and again, for whatever reason, if you couldn't find it or it wasn't playing correctly, I'll have if it, if it was not, we're going to include it in the slide deck that we'll send to you uh, later this evening. Uh, but if, if you didn't have a chance to review, it's a, it's a video case study of this business here on the slide, mid-state machine and fabricated. Um, th this business, just as a quick recap, company was founded in 1975. It's a custom machining and fabricating company servicing the mining, chemical, power generation, and various different heavy industrial markets. So it's, a, it's an in-plant services or field service maintenance company. Um, the company grew very rapidly through the 2000s because of the consolidation uh, in the phosphate industry down here in, in Central Florida. And as the business grew, the owner was the company's chief source of financing, um, something that we regularly see where he was providing the capital it required through personal loans and guarantees. Um, and he oversaw almost every aspect of the company uh, with many direct reports. I mean, this was a company with about 500 different employees um, reporting largely to about a half dozen you know, individuals within management. And as you heard in that video, back in 2012, Hal was involved in a serious car wreck that caused him to really reflect and almost wake up upon the far-reaching consequences you know had that accident you know not not uh, you know had he not survived uh, and without a succession plan or fully developed management team to take over the owner's family would be left to figure out the future of mid-state the employees how to best pay significant estate taxes um, it, it's unfortunate but we see this happen and the company's financial systems at the time were outdated, making it difficult for anyone, you know, internally or externally, to really quickly analyze the business and advise the family on the best course of action. Um, in addition, when you think about just the service offering and the importance in the community of this business, uh, Midstate has very, very large you know, Fortune 1000 esque type customers that depend on this business and its services every single day, literally every single day. And like I mentioned, has over 500 employees reporting to the business every day. So the owner needed to address the key issue of succession planning head on for the sake of his family, employees, and, and clients or customers. Um, so in 2013, just a, a couple months later, um, we got the call and we invested in MidState through a recapitalization. Um, achieving the owner's objectives of asset diversification and succession planning. 
And since partnering with us in 13, we have developed a long-term organizational chart that placed Hal as chairman. Um, we promoted John uh, Hooten, who you saw in the video, Hal's right-hand man to COO. Um, we've hired an experienced CEO and CFO, you know, two different roles, two different people into the business to help Hal and John and Jeff make better decisions. Um, and to that end, we've since implemented new financial reporting systems. We've completed one acquisition that Hal had always wanted, um, but again, didn't want to risk his personal balance sheet to do that, right? He had never bought another business with another you know, company's reputation, company's labor pool, et cetera. Um, so we helped them accomplish that and bringing board ensured the company's future for its employees and the clients while addressing Hal's personal financial well-being. So to, to quickly summarize this case study, you had a family business highly dependent upon one single owner and leader total complete lack of a succession plan you know jeopardized the company's future and the family's financial well-being uh, this business had significant customer concentration greater than 50 percent of revenue was coming from one customer um diversified set of, of of that one customer but you know one company paying the bill for half the revenue um and the owner, Hal, desired to accomplish several company initiatives prior to retirement, right? He wanted to do right by the team and gift equity to a bunch of his key guys. He wanted to do that add-on acquisition, and he wanted to continue to grow the business, and he wanted to share in that upside. So the, uh, the, the ultimate investment structure was Hal sold off um, just over a majority interest in his business to us. Um, we provided the equity capital from our fund and arranged uh, third-party you know, debt financing for the growth of the business um, and avoided any sort of use of personal guarantees or personal assets as collateral, uh, which was a big weight off Hal's shoulders. Um, as we discussed, equity ownership was given for the first time to key managers. Um, and because we've got a committed fund, there's always additional growth capital that's made available to execute, you know, growth plans here. So as a, as a takeaway to this, um, uh, post close, the owner diversified his assets, continued setting the company's direction, you know, as its leader, nothing changed internally or operationally. Um, it was the same business, you know, it was yesterday. Um, we helped shape the organizational chart and gave equity ownership to the key guys, as I've alluded to, um, refinanced the company's debt, banking relationships, removed personal guarantees, which really gave the company access to growth capital, you know, independent of Hal's bank account personally in back pocket. Um, we helped recruit a CFO um, with the help of the current controller and Hal, implemented a new financial reporting systems, and obviously, with those new controls and capital base and us as a partner, um, we got that first add-on acquisition done. So next, we'll chat about um, how you guys can work to identify uh, an owner or a company or a family that's a candidate for a recapitalization. Um, so just brushing on, on these real quickly. So when the company has... And, and you guys should think of when you're hearing these you know, on the first or second meeting with the client or ultimately where you're taking them with your exit planning practice, when you're hearing and learning that this company has become the biggest and most valuable asset you know, of the family personally, and they're, they're at that inflection point of becoming uncomfortable having all of their eggs in one basket, right? That's a big leading indicator. Um, secondly, they need capital and advice, right? And unlike other capital sources, you know, such as just senior or even sub debt or mezzanine lenders, doing a deal with a private equity firm comes with full active strategic support to help them achieve their growth plans and vision for the company. Um, in every partnership with, with our firm, uh, management has control of the day-to-day -day operations. You know, even if we own even 80% of the business, they still have complete control 
um, and autonomy over the day-to-day -day operations, meaningful equity and meaningful ownership as we've discussed in the forward-looking business. Um, I'll say unfettered access to us at a network of relationships. Um, think about when they want a vested partner to help break through barriers to growth, right? Oftentimes, and particularly we're seeing this right now with the economy in the industrial you know, sectors and industries is doing fairly well, customers are asking companies to do more. And that requires, you know, additional growth capital and the right type of growth capital to break through that barrier. And that's a big risk for the business owner personally. Um, another good point is when the partner um, or, or the shareholders partner, there's multiple different owners or business partners. One is ready to retire, but the other or others still have plans to grow the company. Right, and that's a classic recapitalization situation where I'll make this up, but let's say there's three different shareholders. One wants to retire, the other, you know, the other one wants some liquidity but still wants to grow and work, and the other one doesn't want to sell anything, and he or she wants to just put the car in drive and continue to grow. That difference of life goals is a classic recapitalization, and we can structure the ownership a number of different ways there. Um, we work with a lot of businesses where the shareholders are already inactive and they desire liquidity in that. Um, they've already promoted their managers into a CEO or a GM or a presidential role where they are already are running the day to day, but there has not been that financial liquidity event or legal transfer of ownership. Um, it's unfortunate, but we see situations where there's a death for a divorce um, and, and basically other estate planning issues that uh, necessitate and need liquidity. Um, and lastly, as you saw with Hal there, there was never really a direct need to sell the business, right? There was no, uh, you know, he wasn't up against the wall. There wasn't, you know, an immediate need for liquidity, but I think it's never too early to take a proactive approach. I mean, particularly right now, economy is doing very well, the lending and the debt markets are doing very well. It's a good time to enter into these types of relationships. And a, a recap can be a first step towards the ultimate harvest of your investment and retirement. Um, a a multi-step monetization approach, such as a recap with an experienced you know, financial partner increases the company's value as we discussed and reduces the risk of unfavorable market conditions, you know, in what would normally be a single event sale approach, right? Um, so this really comes down to understanding the owner's goals and objectives, right? And, and in our conversations, they're typically surrounded by these three items, a, a desire to diversify your assets or get a liquidity event, Maybe it's for one of the shareholders, maybe it's for all shareholders, et cetera. Um, somebody wants to grow the business, whether that's a current shareholder or a couple rungs down the org chart, there's a couple managers who want to take the business and continue growing, right? And then lastly, succession planning. So the key here is there's typically one or two or three of these related items that are the driving force to, to facilitate a recapitalization. Um, another, I'll use the word misconception here, is, you know, is my business big enough or good enough for a private equity group? Um, and that's a, that's a classic question and misconception. And, and I know a number of you guys have probably seen this slide from another couple of events that we put on. Um, but we will uh, look at this business with you as the exit planner or as the, as the advisor. And we'll chat about company size, financial trends, margin trends, how the customers have been behaving, customers coming back every year, or is the business rather project based? You know, we will internally here at KLH dissect each of these five or six different constituencies. Um, our goal is to ultimately figure out, you know, how risky is this? Um, the more uh, stable the annual cash flow is, the less risk that is perceived. 
Um, so these are a couple of the different topics that you guys can start to chat about with your, your clients as it relates to private equity. But I'll tell you, again, particularly to our market, you know, companies with 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 million of revenue, it's not at all uncommon that we see a company with a little bit of customer concentration or like with a lot of customer concentration and you can use a recapitalization as step one to diversify that customer base um, and that was one of the initiatives that we focused on with Hap was he has a big customer and he wanted to do an add-on to bolt on additional revenue and profit to get that customer percentage of total revenue down um, so you can use the recap access to additional capital to, to diversify, all while obviously increasing the value of, of that business. Um, so just lastly, your understanding and, and, and how to introduce, introduce this concept to your clients. To your clients. Um, so this, we've noticed the, that the, the pre-deal conversations um, look more, more items, items that are tailored to this topic. Right. If, if, if the business owners are talking about or are you bringing, bringing up uh, to, the to the business owner, owner in active shareholders, uh, unfortunately, shareholder disputes, right? Somebody wants out, somebody wants in, in. difference in timing amongst the shareholders, uh, retirement, retirement planning, planning, marital property, property liquidity, liquidity needs, estate planning, planning et cetera. Et cetera. And then, and then organizationally, organizationally you know, capacity, capacity expansion, expansion you need a new facility, facility you need access, access more working capital, capital. Your, your vendors or your suppliers are consolidating, consolidating. You, you want, want to get ahead of that, that. or you want, you want that. So, so when, when you're hearing these types of things, these are all these are topics, topics that you can start, start to, to think, think recapitalization. Um, and as we've, as we've attempted to show you today, uh, how Hershey's case, case study, study it's, it's on our uh, company, company website, alhcapital.com. Uh, you'll, uh, you'll find a couple, a couple of videos there, there, there but, but, but you can share Hal's story with clients by taking, clients the, link, by taking uh, the link from our website. From our website. Likewise, you can find, Likewise, it you can find it on YouTube. And then I will send, then you, I will send you a brochure, uh, a brochure on recap. So we put together uh, an industry, uh, an industry white paper, you know, white case study, paper, for lack of a better word, that walks through the majority of that, that uh, walks in, through in the detail. Majority and then lastly, uh, and I do this all the time, uh, but we have. And then lastly, uh, uh, and I do this all the time. Time, but we have uh, confidential um, calls. I do this with you guys all the time, as a lot of you may know. Families and um, there's a lot of calls that we take um, on a. On a I literally do this with you guys all the time, as a lot of you may know. I don't um, know. A lot of calls that we take or even like on, a, on a literally entirely confidential basis. basis. I don't know the name of the shareholder or even equity. likewise the name of the. You know, what, what is a recap? What's a management buyout? What's a generational transfer? About how I would evaluate the risk of that business. Uh, totally generation uh, transfer confidential. How so, I would evaluate the risk. Uh, we're a resource for you guys. You know, um, totally we've been working uh, with the EPI. I know a lot so, of you uh, know uh, us we're for a resource well, but, for you, know, you guys. We've been working with you guys for um, a have been working with so a lot of you uh, that at this point in time. Uh, we've been we can either with you open it up a number of years and happy to be your resource. Um, or if not, Drew, we can wrap this up, and, and I will send you up, a copy Drew, we wrap of this presentation, and, and I will send as well as the link to the video. Um, but I, I greatly well, appreciate everybody's time. Happy New Year, and, uh, and I greatly see appreciate you all soon. Time. Happy New Year, and I will chat and see you all soon. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Kyle. I appreciate it. Um, there were a couple questions that came in, but what I'll do is I'll send those over to you, Kyle, with the... Uh, the registration list and maybe you could send out an email just touching base on those um, as so we can get people back into their day today uh, but I just want to take a time say thank you to Kyle thank you everyone for joining us today uh, if you have any questions or anything else that you weren't able to put into the chat box please go ahead and send those to either myself or Kyle uh, we'll get those answered for you immediately uh, and then also I'll be sending out the recording later today uh, so just look for uh, the attachment with that uh, from me and with that uh, we will go ahead and conclude the webinar today, uh, get everyone back into their day. Hopefully everyone has a good day, good rest of the week. Uh, and Kyle, we'll talk soon. Thank you very much.